ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبد ورسوله ما بعد so we continue the explanation of surah al-maida page 112 uh, here we saw last week because this is related to uh, this week's uh, page of topics Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said قال اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قال رجلان من الذين يخافون انعم الله عليهما two men from those who feared Allah and whom Allah has bestowed his grace on said uh, we said we saw before that when the children of Israel were ordered by Musa alayhi salam to enter Jerusalem and fight uh, the people that were inhabiting it uh, they told them that in it there were some strong mighty people and that you know, we're not going to fight them, we're not going to enter Jerusalem until they, they leave Jerusalem. So they don't want to do make any effort. They want uh, Jerusalem to be empty for them to go in there uh, without need to waste jihad for the sake of Allah, as their Prophet Musa السلام, ordered them to do. So he said when the children of Israel declined to obey Allah's order and follow his messenger Musa السلام, two righteous men among them, on whom Allah had bestowed great bounty and who were afraid of Allah and his punishment, encouraged the Jews to go forward and fight. It was also said, it, it was also said that the ayah reads in a way that means that these two men were respected among their people and honored. These two men were Yusha bin Nun, Yusha the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Yufna. These are the two pious people that told the rest of the Jews to obey Musa alayhi salam, according to Ibn Abbas, Mujahid Ikrim, Atiyah, Suddi Rabi' bin Anas, and several other Salaf, and later and later scholars uh, as well. This was their opinion. These two men said to the people, to the Jews, Udhulu alayhim ul bab, fa ila da khatumu fa innakum ghalibum, wa ala Allahi fatawakalu in kuntum mu'minin. They told them, assault them through the gate. Because when you are in, then victory will be yours. In other words, just start the, the effort and Allah will give you victory. And put your trust in Allah if you are believers indeed. Therefore, they said, these two men, uh, Yusha bin Nun and Kilab bin Yufna, they said, if you rely on and trust in Allah, then follow Allah's command and obey his messenger Musa alayhi salam. Then Allah will give you victory over your enemies and will give you triumph and dominance over them. Thus, you will conquer the city that Allah has promised you. This advice did not benefit them in the least. Instead, they replied by saying, قَالُوا يَا مُوسَىٰ إِنَّا لَن نَدْخُلَهَا أَبَدًا نَدَامُوا فِيهَا فَذَهَبَ أَنْتَ وَرَبُّكَ فَقَاتِلَا إِنَّا هَنُنَا قَاعِدُونَ They said, O Musa, we shall never enter it as long as they are there. So go you and your Lord and fight you too. We are sitting right there, here. So this is how the Jews declined to join jihad, defied the order of their messenger Musa alayhi salam, and refused to fight their enemy. In comparison, we're going to see here the response of the Muslims when the Prophet sallam told them to fight in the battle of Badr. Compare this to the better, that means compare the response of the Jews that told Musa to go and fight him and his Lord and that they're going to sit there, wait for, for the town to be ready for them to enter it. It says, compare this to the better response that the companions of the Allah who gave the messenger of Allah وسلم, during the battle of Badr. When the Prophet وسلم, asked for their advice about finding the Quraysh, ar Quraysh army that came to protect the caravan that was led by Abu, Abu Sufyan. So Abu Sufyan had a caravan that was going to Asham, uh, the Levant, so that he can sell those uh, uh, products. And obviously, as you know, uh, before Muslims left Mecca, the Quraysh uh, confiscated their properties. So it was just rightful for the Muslims to attack the caravan and get back a substitution for whatever was taken away from them by force. But uh, Abu Sufyan had a Quraysh army that was uh, about 900 to 1,000 strong that was uh, protecting the caravan from the Muslims. When the Muslim army missed the caravan and the Quraysh army between 900 and 1000 strong helmeted and was drawing closer to the Muslims, Abu Bakr stood up and said something good. Several, several more Muhajirin also spoke all the while, all, all the, while the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was saying, Ashiru alayya ayyuhal muslimun, advise me, O Muslims. 
because even though the muhajirun told the prophet he was gonna they, they were gonna fight with him the prophet وسلم, because as allah said he always uh, was asking the people around him for advice you know he was not this dictator uh, ordering things and making making up his mind without consulting with his companions the prophet وسلم, told, told them advise me or muslims but the prophet وسلم, was in reality inquiring about what the ansar's answer was going to be this is because the ansar when they gave the pledge to protect the prophet وسلم, they gave him the pledge to protect him inside medina in other words if someone tried to harm him in medina then the ansar would defend him and they did not give him the pledge that they would go out and fight with him that's why the prophet وسلم, knew that you know he was not given this pledge to fight outside the medina that's why he وسلم, out of his uh, sense of justice was asking the ansar are you willing to fight the Quraysh or should we just go back to Medina? So here the Prophet ﷺ was more concerned about what the Ansar wanna, uh, were going to say. So Sa'd bin Mu'ad, one of the leaders of the Ansar, he understood why the Messenger ﷺ was still saying, advise me all Muslims, even though uh, major Sahaba uh, like Abu Bakr were already telling him to go forth. So Sa'd bin Mu'ad understood the message and he says, it looks like you mean us, O Messenger of Allah Wasallam." By he, so Sa'd bin Mu'ad continues, say, by he who has sent you with the truth, he swear by Allah, if you seek to cross this sea and when in it, we will follow you and none among us will remain behind. We would not hate for you to lead us to meet our enemy tomorrow. We are patient in war, vicious in battle. May Allah allow you to witness from our efforts what comforts your eyes. Therefore, march forward with the blessing of Allah. The Messenger of Allah was pleased, pleased with the words of Sa'd and encouraged to march on. I mean, look, subhanAllah, look at the difference between this Ummah, the Muslims, and between the Jews. The Prophet ﷺ was the only one from the lineage of Ismail السلام, and he was given to the final Ummah. And these are the true Muslims until today. They, they're never afraid of their enemy. It doesn't matter if their enemies have nuclear weapons, they have hundreds of thousands of soldiers, because they know that victory is only given by Allah and only taken away by Allah. All we have to do is be sincere in our intention to fight for the sake of Allah and come where it may. Because as we know, as Muslims, Allah says in the Quran, when a Muslim believer fights for the sake of Allah in jihad, one of two things are going to happen. Allah calls it in, in Surah Tawbah, Ihda al one of, one of two good endings. So when a Muslim fights for the sake of Allah, he's going to have one of two good endings. There's no bad ending when a Muslim fights for the sake of Allah. The first good ending is that he's going to attain martyrdom and he would have you know, basically been successful in his existence. Because after that, he goes directly to, to Jannah and, you know, the martyrs, they are treated uh, with, with such honor to the point, as the Prophet told us, that the martyr wants to go back to this earth and be killed for the sake of Allah 10 times because he has seen how much honor he's being treated with in the hereafter. So first, good and then is martyrdom. Second good and then is uh, to, to, to win in the battle and get the war booty. There is no such thing as a loss when a person fights for the sake of Allah. So these are the feelings that make this ummah so unique compared to the rest of the nations. And this is why the enemies of Islam, they are targeting this ummah to try to change the true teachings of Islam so that the Muslims no longer put their trust in Allah, so that the Muslims are afraid from their enemies, so that their enemies can invade them, can plunder the wealth in their countries, can bring evil into their societies, zina, uh, uh, wanton display of women, uh, homosexuality, and all the evil that shaitan has made so rampant in the disbelieving societies. The followers of shaitan and disbelievers want to instill and uh, uh, institute in the Muslim lands. But they can only do that, they can only do that if they take away the faith from the hearts of the Muslims. Because if Muslims have the true faith in Allah, these disbelievers will not to be able, will not be able to gain not even an inch with the Muslims. Because this type of answer 
Sa'ad bin Mu'ad give the Messenger more than 430 years ago, this is the same answer that the true believers will say today to their Muslim leader who is ordering them to go to jihad. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed, and this is what makes this ummah so unique. And as we know, and as we said many times, it's true, the past 90 some odd years, the Muslims have been defeated, uh, Muslim countries have been invaded, uh, Muslim women have been raped, uh, Muslim children and elderly have been destroyed by, by uh, the destroy, destruction bombs and all different types of weapons. But this is only a temporary, a temporary situation that the Prophet ﷺ did tell us. We're, we were, Prophet did tell us that the Muslims were going to undergo this difficult period of time because of their sins and because they are away from Allah's teachings. But the Prophet ﷺ also told us that it is only a matter of time before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns the tide or turns things around and will give Muslims uh, the kingdom once again on this earth and will make them leaders in the truth establishing justice in this earth the same way that it has been filled with injustice through the leadership of the disbelieving nations. So here, Sa'd bin Mu'ad gave an answer that is starkly different from the answer that the Jews told Musa alayhi salam when they told him, you and your Lord, go and fight. We are sitting right here. This is the answer of the Jews to Musa alayhi salam. While the answer of the Ansar and the Muhajireen is that march forth, march forward with the blessing of Allah, you will see from us that which will please your eyes. Abu Bakr bin Mardawiyah recorded that Anas said that when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, went to the Battle of Badr, he asked the Muslims for their opinion, and Umar gave his. The Prophet وسلم, then asked the Muslims again for their opinion, and the Ansar understood that they were meant by this question. So they said, O oh, Ansar, it is you whom the Prophet wants to hear. Then the Ansar said, We will never say, as the children of Israel said to Musa, So go, you and your Lord, and fight you too. We are sitting here there by he who has sent you with the truth, O Muhammad. If you took the camels to Barq al a place that is far away near Mecca, we shall follow you. So this was the answer of the Ansar, O Prophet of um, and Messenger of Allah, march forth, we are with you, because you are sent by the Lord of the truth, and everything you're calling for, you are fighting for, is the truth, so we will follow you wherever you take us. Imam Ahmad al nasai and Ibn Hibban also recorded this hadith. In the book of Al-Maghazi and Al-Tafsir Al-Bukhari recorded that Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, on the day of Badr, Al-Miqdad said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, who will never say to you what the children of Israel said to Musa, so go you and your Lord and fight you two who are sitting right here. Rather, march on and we will be with you. The Messenger of Allah was satisfied after hearing this statement. Compare this to what Musa السلام, felt when the Jews told him that answer. The Prophet السلام, here was satisfied after hearing this statement from his followers. But Musa السلام, when he heard the statement of his followers, he supplicated against them. He supplicated against them, of course. Here he is, Musa alayhi salam, going through so much hardship, showing the miracles to Fir'aun, destroying uh, the biggest army that, that existed at the time, saving the Jews from the slavery of Fir'aun. And yet, when he orders them to enter this town, and Allah will give them victory over these people who are much weaker than Fir'aun, they tell him, oh, you and your Lord go and fight. I mean, of course, how was Musa alayhi salam going to feel, sallallahu alayhi wasallam? May Allah's blessing be on him. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the Jews also, they actually uh, uh, insulted Musa alayhi uh, salam. This is in there, this is inherent in the way that they were created. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَزَالُ تَطَّلِعُ عَلَى خَائِنَةٍ مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا قَرِيَ مِنْهُمْ Surely you will always find that the Jews are betraying you, except a few among them. And it's something that we are witnessing today in the world by whatever they're doing to our Palestinian brothers. They're killing them, they're raping their women, they're confiscating their lands. They never adhere to any, uh, uh, to any uh, convention or any law that is made by the United Nations. 
Even they agree to some accords like the Oslo Accord, Oslo Accord in 1994. By ne they never stick to that accord. They always betray the people who trust them. And these people who are betrayed, they deserve to be betrayed because they go into negotiations with the people whom Allah has told them everything about. And yet they still believe them. They believe that whenever they sign an accord, they're going to give them whatever they promised them because these people that believe the Jews have not understood Islam, even though they claim to be Muslims. So here Musa alayhi salam supplicated against the Jews. He said, قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي لَا أَمْلِكُ إِلَّا نَفْسِي وَأَخِي فَفْرَقُ بَيْنَا وَبَيْنَا الْقَامِ الْفَاسِقِينَ Oh my Lord, I have power only over myself and my brother. Because these are the only two people that, that Musa alayhi salam can control. So separate us from the rebellious people. When the children of Israel refused to fight, Musa alayhi salam became very angry with them and supplicated Allah against them. He says, Rabbi inni la amliku illa nafsi wa akhi. Oh my Lord, I only have power over myself and my brother, meaning only I and my brother Harun among them will obey, implement Allah's command and accept the call. Fafruq bayna wa bayna al-qawm al-fasiqeen. So ufruq us from the rebellious people. Al-Awf reported that Ibn Abbas said, ufruq here means judge between us and them. Ali ibn Abi Talha reported similarly from Ibn Abbas. So Musa alayhi salam said, judge between us and them. al Haq said that the ayah means judge, judge and decide between us and them. Other scholars said that the ayah means separate between us and them because Musa alayhi salam was so mad at them. He saved them from Fir'aun. Then after, just immediately after being saved from their enemy, they tell Musa, make us a god so that we can worship. And then when Musa went to, uh, to, to the Mount, uh, Mount Sinai, Jabal al tur so that Allah can speak to him, the Jews adopted a, a calf as a statue and they worshipped him. I mean, haven't they seen all the miracles that Allah has given Musa السلام, and still they worship a calf? So Musa السلام, uh, was upset with them and rightly so. Then because of their transgression, because they disobeyed the command to wish jihad for the sake of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished the Jews by forbidding them from entering the Holy Land for four years. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنَّا مُحَرَّمَةٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةً يَتِيهُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ We said here these three dots, meaning you can either stop here or stop here. You cannot stop in these two places. Or of course you can read it all together in one, in one sentence. Allah says, therefore it is forbidden to them for four years. In distraction they will wander through the land. When Musa السلام, supplicated against the Jews for refusing to fight in jihad, Allah forbade them from entering the land, uh, the holy land that is, for four years. They wandered about, lost in the land of Atiyah, in the, in the Sinai desert, unable to find their way out. During this time, tremendous miracles occurred. You know, even, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished, punished them, but he was merciful to them. He sent clouds above them to shade them from the scorching heat. Uh, and he sent them the manna is a liquid that's kind of like uh, the Canadian syrup and quails. Uh, these are, are birds that would come all the way to them and they'd be able to catch them with their own hands and slaughter them and eat them. So Allah sent all these things from them out of mercy. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought forth water springs from solid rocks as we saw in Surah Al-Baqarah. There were 12 tribes. Each tribe had its own rock where the water would flow from that rock for each tribe to drink from that rock because if there was only one rock with water then the tribes would have fought among themselves for water. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave each tribe its, its own rock out of mercy from him. Also, there are other miracles that he did Musa bin Imran with. As we said before, Musa alayhi salam had the, the staff. <coughs> uh, he also, you know, when he, he put his hand in his, uh, uh, you know, the opening of his, uh, of his garment, the upper opening ne near the, uh, the neck, and he would take it out, it would shine with light. Uh, also, Musa alayhi salam uh, spoke to Allah, Musa alayhi salam brought the Torah to the children of Israel and, and more and more miracles that the children of Israel witness with their own eyes. But as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their hearts are harder than rocks because some rocks, like this, 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 like in this case, some rocks, you see water that flows through these rocks, but their hearts, no goodness, no truth flows through their, their, their hearts. Their hearts are stronger than rocks. 
Also during this time, the Torah is revealed and the law for the children of Israel was established and the tabernacle of the covenant was erected. Now this tabernacle, what it is, is uh, it's like a place of worship. I'm going to show you the picture here. Do you see the picture of the, the structure here? Yes, someone, do you see the picture? Yeah, um, yeah, we saw it. Yeah. Okay, so this is what is called the tabernacle of worship. It's like a masjid, right? That the Jews built at the time of Musa alayhi salam. Uh, it's a structure. These are like wooden pillars uh, that constitute a frame. And then it's covered by four layers of cloth and skin so that, you know, water doesn't enter. And then this tabernacle is uh, is divided into two portions. This first portion here, a small area, uh, has the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is a tabut that is in, in, in mentioned in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah. It's a box that has some of the uh, personal effects of Musa alayhi salam and Harun. Uh, so this is like a, a revered uh, item for the Jews. As, and, and we said this is a small area. You see there's a curtain here that comes here. So it separates this uh, housing structure into two sides. And then there is an altar for incense. You know, they put like Bukhur, the thing for smell. Uh, this is the golden lampstand, the one you see uh, the, the Jews uh, erecting in their holiday called Hanukkah. It has uh, seven lights. And then there's also a table that they say, you know, according to them, it's a table of the presence. Now, what they say here, this is their place of worship. And they say that uh, God comes to speak to his people here. He came to speak to Musa alayhi salam in a cloud, like not physically, but, you know, through a cloud. And they're saying that in the bread should always be here so that when the Lord comes to speak to Musa or after him to their rabbis, the bread always has to be here. Now, of course, these are uh, creeds of the Jews that have some type of uh, you know, they give some human characteristics to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is he above what they say? But in any event, when just wanted to explain what the meaning of the tabernacle is, but it's like a masjid. It's just like a, a masjid. Uh, you know, and there are some other uh, pictures on the internet that depict what the this tabernacle uh, looked like. So like this picture that I can find it on Google. So it's like, this is the place of worship. It's like their masjid. And then it's also surrounded by a wall. Right? So it kind of looks like the current Masjid Al-Aqsa, you know. Masjid Al-Aqsa is like, you know, it's it's a compound that is surrounded by a huge wall. And there is Masjid Al-Aqsa here. And then there is Masjid Qubbat Al-Sakhra here. There is two masajid in the compound of Masjid Al-Aqsa. So this basically was erected at the time of Musa alayhi salam. And it's like, you know, what we know today for Muslims, we know as uh, as a masjid, right? So that's their place of worship. Uh, but of course, you know, we can't say that they are worshiping Allah. They are worshiping uh, their own version of uh, of their Lord, whom they called Yahweh. Okay, switch screen back to PDF. So back to the tafsir. You see in the tafsir now? You see in the explanation? Back to the explanation. Brother, see tafsir in Kathir now? You know, you see now. Okay. So this was the tabernacle of the covenant. You know, that's when it was built, when the Jews were lost in the, in the desert. Conquering Jerusalem, Allah's statement, Arba'ina sana, for four years, defines Yatihuna fil ard. In distraction, they will wander through the land. So Allah subhanahu wa says that the Jews will wander in the land for four years. They're not allowed to find their way back to Jerusalem. When these years ended, when these 40 years ended, now the scholars said, uh, you know, it's four years so that uh, Yusha bin Nun, okay, when these years, when these four years ended, Yusha bin Nun, 
let those who remained among them and the second generation and laid siege to Jerusalem. So some scholars said that those four years was enough for the generation that lived under the slavery of Fir'aun to die out because those were the people that were too weak hearted to fight for the sake of Allah. And a new generation arose that grew up in the desert in freedom. And they were the one who were able to conquer uh, Jerusalem, although they also were uh, transgressing the bounds set to them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when these years ended, Yusha bin Nun led those who remained among them and the second generation and laid siege to Jerusalem, conquering it on a Friday afternoon. When the sun was about to set and Yusha feared that the Sabbath would begin, he said to the sun, you are commanded and I am commanded as well. O oh Allah, make it stop setting for me. Allah made the sun stop setting until Yusha bin Nun conquered Jerusalem. Now, because the Jews, they observe a Sabbath and the Sabbath starts from the sunset on Friday. So on a Sabbath, they're not allowed to do any trade, any commerce or fight or anything like that. Uh, so Yusha bin Nun, by the way, was one of the two pious people that told the Jews to fight for the sake of Allah before Allah ordered them to wander for four years. And he was the prophet after Musa alayhi salam, because during those 40 years, Harun alayhi salam died, uh, died first, and then Musa alayhi salam died, and Yusha took over. So he led this new generation, and it was on a Friday afternoon, and he made supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the sun stop saying for him, and Allah uh, answered his his call and the sun did not set until Allah enabled the children of Israel to conquer Jerusalem. Now, of course, we're going to have some naysayers among the Muslims today or other. They're going to say, well, uh, the sun is going in its due course. How is it possible for it to stop? And how we're going to tell him, of course, it is possible if you were the one that made this sun, if you were the one that set this sun in its current course, then maybe you can tell me that it's impossible because you are the one who controlling the sun. But since you are not the one, O oh son of Adam, you're not the one who set this sun on its course, and it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who set the sun on its course and everything else, Allah is able to do everything. Because the same way that it's difficult for the sun to be created, to be put in this perfect distance from earth, etc., etc., it's very difficult for you, it's impossible for you. But if Allah, for Allah, it was possible. So why would it be possible for Allah to create this huge creature like the sun? And for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this sun far away from earth, just enough for us not to freeze to death or to burn to death. And then you tell me that Allah is not able to stop the sun from setting? Of course, you know, just using logic, you can see that uh, these people, they are just naysayers for the sake of being uh, obnoxious. Next, Allah commanded Yusha to order the children of Israel to enter Jerusalem for its, from its gate while bowing and saying hitta. That means now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, here is a new generation. Allah gave this new generation victory as he had promised to give victory to their forefathers before. And Allah was telling them, enter Jerusalem in humility, thanking Allah for giving you victory over this strong enemy. And saying, oh Allah, hitta, that means oh Allah put down and remove our sins from us. But instead of doing that, they changed what they were commanded to say and answered it, answered it. Instead of answering it, bowing and making sujood, they answered it while dragging themselves on their behinds, laughing and saying, habba fi sha'ra. Instead of saying hitta, they say habba fi sha'ra. That means a seed, a seed in a hair. Because hinta, Hinta fi sunbula. Hinta fi sunbula. Hinta looks like hitta. So their manager told them, say hitta, and they say, oh, hinta. Hinta fi sunbula. So they start mocking the words commanded uh, that they were commanded to say by their prophet. And instead of making sujood and bowing while entering Jerusalem, they, they, uh, they entered dragging themselves on their behinds and laughing and mocking the instructions of their prophet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them through a, uh, a plague that descended on them uh, immediately. Ibn Abi Hatim recorded that Ibn Abbas commented, 
فَإِنَّا مُحَرَّمَةٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةٍ يَتِيهُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ Therefore it is forbidden to them for 40 years in this traction they will wander through the land. So the Jews wandered in the land for four years, during which Musa and Harun died, as well as everyone above four years of age. So we said this is the generation that lived in slavery. They all died out. When the four years ended, Yusha, son of Nun, assumed their leadership and later conquered Jerusalem. When Yusha was reminded that, that the day was Friday and the sun was about to set, while they were still attacking Jerusalem, he feared that the Sabbath might begin. Therefore, he said to the sun, I am commanded, that means I am commanded to fight for the sake of Allah, and you are commanded to take your due course to set. But, you know, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the sun stop from setting. And Allah answered his dua, and the Jews conquered Jerusalem and found wealth and seen before. Now, uh, before, before Muhammad والسلام, no other prophet was allowed to gain the booty of war. Instead, every time they conquered a city and they, they, uh, they got the booty, the booty of war, they would gather that booty of war in a, in a plane and Allah would send a, a lightning, a fire from above that would burn that, that booty of war. Muhammad والسلام, one of his special qualities is that he's the first prophet uh, to whom the booty of war was allowed as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us in Surah Al-Anfal in chapter 8. لَوْلَا كِتَابٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ سَبَقَ لَمَسَّكُمْ فِي مَا أَخَذْتُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ فَكُلُوا مِمَّا غَنِمْتُمْ حَلَلًا طَيِّبًا كُلُوا مِمَّا غَنِمْتُمْ غَنِيمًا حَلَلًا طَيِّبًا They wanted to let the fire consume the booty. So now they conquered Jerusalem, they found so much wealth. Okay, now obviously they gathered this wealth uh, so that the fire can consume the booty. But the fire would not do that. So Yusha said, some of you have committed theft from the booty. That means the booty is not complete. Someone stole something, so Allah did not accept the booty yet. So Yusha summoned the 12 leaders of the 12 tribes of, of uh, the Jews and took the pledge from them. That means, you know, he shook their hands. Then the hand of one of them became stuck to the hand of Yusha. So this person, because he stole something, his, his hand was stuck to the hand of Yusha. And Yusha told him, you committed the theft, so bring it forth. In other words, bring back whatever you, you, you stole so that we can, uh, so that the, the booty of war is complete and so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can send the fire to consume that booty of war. So that man brought a cow's head. My God, none other than a cow's head. Made of gold with two eyes made of precious stones and a set of teeth made of pearls. Now, it's not a coincidence that this person stole a cow's head because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did tell us that the Jews, when they worshipped the cow, their hearts absorbed the love of the cow. Their hearts absorbed the love of the cow to the point that even after 40 years, one of them sees the head of the cow and he loves it so much that he seals it. He commits theft so he can take this cow's head. Because as we said, the Jews lived in a disbelieving country under Fir'aun and the disbelievers used to worship Osiris, who was a god, a statue in the form of a bull. So they were impacted by this practice of the disbelievers. This is why the scholars said that the Muslims who live under disbelieving laws and in a disbelieving country, their hearts will absorb whatever religious uh, rituals those disbelievers are undertaking, like Christmas, like statues, like uh, cross. So we see that in many of the generations that were raised in the uh, Kafir land. Uh, many of them, they bear Muslim names, but their actions and their feelings and their convictions are uh, impacted by the way that disbelievers worship their statues in those disbelieving lands. So this person here, this Jew, as Allah told us, his heart absorbed the love of the of the cow. That's only he saw a cow's head. He just couldn't help it, but try to keep it for himself. Now, you know, uh, irrespective of the fact that it was made out of gold with two eyes, made of precious stones, etc. There were other things. He could have taken other things, but he took a cow's head because the love of the cow was absorbed by his heart and Allah knows best. So when Yusha added this cow's head to the booty, the fire consumed it 
as they were prohibited to keep the booty, as we said. There is evidence supporting all of this in the Sahih Hadith. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comforts Musa. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam, فَلَا تَأْسَى عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ so do not grieve for the rebellious people. Allah said, do not feel sorrow or sadness over my judgment against them because they deserve such a judgment. That means to order, to order them to be lost in the desert for years. This story chastises the Jews, exposes their defiance of Allah and his messenger and their refusal to obey the order for jihad. They were weak the thought of fighting their enemy they could not bear the thought of being patient and enduring the hardship of jihad this occurred although they had the measure of allah وسلم, with them whom he spoke to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the jews had musa السلام, not any type of messenger he was a messenger that spoke to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the best of allah's creation at that time their prophet Musa السلام, promised them triumph and victory against their enemies. They also witnessed the torment and punishment of drowning with which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished their enemy Fin'aun and his soldiers. So that their eyes were pleased and comforted. In other words, they saw the destruction of their enemies in front of their eyes. It's not like someone told them that their enemy was destroyed because later on they may say maybe it's not true. No, they saw it with their own eyes. All this did not happen too long ago. And yet, when they were ordered to perform jihad, they refused. It was jihad against people who had less power than Fir'aun. People who had less than a tenth of power and strength than the people of Egypt had, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had destroyed. Therefore, the evil works of the Jews were exposed to everyone. And the exposure was such an enormous one that the night or the tail can never cover its tracks. See, this is a statement meaning that the exposure was so big that no one could argue against it. They were also blinded by their ignorance and transgression. Thus, they became hated by Allah. They became hated by Allah. Does Allah hate people? Of course. Allah hates the disbelievers. It's in the Quran. The disbelievers are called by the angels and they are told, Allah hates you more than you hate yourselves. So here there is a statement that the disbelievers, internally they hate themselves, even if outwardly they, they try to act like they are happy. And this is the reason why they see them trying to change the way they look, trying to change the haircut, put in tattoos, put in uh, nose rings, uh, earrings, uh, uh, belly rings, all types of things because they don't like the way they look. So they always try to change the way they look so that they can try start to love themselves but they will not be able to do that unless they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they remain disbelievers, then Allah hates them and they hate themselves. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hated the Jews because of their transgression and they became his enemies. Yet they claim that they are Allah's children and his loved ones. May Allah curse their faces that were transformed to the shape of swan and apes. And may Allah's curse accompany them to the raging fire. May Allah make them abide in the fire for eternity. And he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, did promise us that he will do that. All thanks are due to him. A'udhu billah min ash-shaitan rajim. Wa atma alayhim naba abnai adama bil haqi idh qarraba qurbana fatuqubbila min ahadihima wa lam yutaqabbal min al-akhari qala la aqatul annak qala inna يتقبل الله من المتقين لئن بسطت إلي يدك لتقتلني ما أنا بباسط يدي إليك لأقتلك إني أخاف الله رب العالمين إني أريد أن تبوء بإثمي وإثمك فتكون من أصحاب النار وذلك جزاء الظالمين فطوعت له نفسه قتل أخيه فقتله فأصبح من الخاسرين فبعث الله غرابا يبحث في الأرض ليريه كيف يواري سوءة أخيه قال يا ويلتا أعجزت أن أكون مثل هذا الغراب فأواري سوءة أخي فأصبح من النادمين So after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
told Muhammad والسلام, the story of Musa والسلام, with his people and of their transgression. He told him and recite to the Jews the story of the two sons of Adam in truth. Now we can understand the, the relationship between the story of the two sons of Adam with the Jews. And recite to them the story of the two sons of Adam in truth. When each offer, each of these two sons offered a sacrifice. It was accepted from one of them, but was not accepted from the other. The latter said to the former, that means the one whose sacrifice was not accepted, told to the one whose sacrifice was accepted, I will surely kill you. The former, the one whose sacrifice was accepted, said, Verily, Allah accepts only from those who have taqwa. If you do stretch your hand against me to kill me, I shall never stretch my hand against you to kill you because I fear Allah, the Lord of all there exists. Verily, I intend to let you draw my sin on yourselves as well as yours. Then you will be one of the dwellers of the fire and there is a recompense of the wrongdoers. So the soul of the other whose offering was not accepted encouraged him and made fair seem to him the murder of his brother. So he murdered him and became one of the losers. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a crow who scratched the ground to show the killer how to hide the dead body of his killed brother. He said, the killer said, woe to me, am I not even able to be like this crow and to be able to hide the body of my brother? Then he became one of those who regret it. The story of Habil and Qabil. Abel and Cain. Abel, A, this is a good one. C, this is a bad one, okay? <clears throat> so, because sometimes the names, they get uh, mixed up for people. A is good, C is bad, okay? Just like education. Allah describes the evil, the evil end and consequences of transgression, envy and injustice in the story of the two sons of Adam. So here Allah describes the evil end and consequences of transgression, envy and injustice. These three things, there are common traits between the Jews and Cain. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after mentioning the Jews and their transgression, he told Muhammad sallallahu and tell them the story of the two sons and what happened to Cain because of his transgression and because of his envy and because of his justice. Because the Jews are envious of Muhammad sallallahu and they do injustice to themselves and other people and they transgress against all people. So here Allah is telling them, try to take heed and learn from the lesson of Cain who had these evil qualities that you have, O children of Israel. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the evil end and consequences of the transgression, of transgression, envy and injustice in the story of the two sons of Adam, Habil and Qabil. One of them fought against the other and killed him out of envy and transgression. Okay, envy and transgression. And this is why the Jews wanted to kill Muhammad because of the bounty that Allah gave his brother, okay, and because the sacrifice that he sincerely offered to Allah. So Abel was sincere, and that's why Allah accepted his offering. The murdered brother, Abel, earned forgiveness for his sins and was admitted into paradise, while the murderer, Cain, failed and earned a losing deal in both lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَى أَبْنَيْ آدَمَ بِالْحَقِّ And recite to them the story of the two sons of Adam in truth, meaning, tell these envious, unjust Jews, the brothers of swine and apes from the Jews and their likes among mankind, tell them the story of the two sons of Adam, Habil and Qabil, as many scholars among the Salaf and later generations said. So, as we said, the common trait between Qabil and the Jews is that they are both envious and unjust people. Allah SWT says, Bilhaq, in truth, meaning clearly, without ambiguity, without alteration, without adding anything, without confusion, without change, addition or deletion. Allah said in another ayah about the, the, the stories that Allah is telling us in the Quran, Verily, this is the true narrative about the story of Isa, uh, you know, in that, in, that, uh, in, in that surah when Allah says this. In other words, if you read something in the Quran and you read another story in another book that is different from that in the Quran, then truly what Allah narrated in the Quran is the true narrative 
and the other version is the wrong version because Allah tells the truth. Then Allah says in another ayah, نحن نقص عليك لنبهم بالحق about the people of the cave in chapter 18. We narrate into you their story with truth. And also in uh, another in another ayah, Allah says, ذلك عيسى بن مريم قول الحق الذي فيه يمترون. This is in Surah Taha. Allah says, such as Isa, son of Maryam, uh, in in a statement of truth uh, about about whom they have uh, they have differed. Several scholars among the Salaf and later generations said that Allah allowed Adam to marry his daughters to his sons because of the necessity of such actions. They also said that in every pregnancy, Adam السلام, was given a twin, a male and a female, and he used to give the female of one twin to the male of the other twin in marriage. Okay, so in the beginning of time, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam السلام, and Hawa, they were the only human beings. So every time Hawa gave birth, she gave birth to twins. These twins, one of them was a, a male, the other one was a female. Now these twins, it was haram for them to marry each other. The twins that were born in the same uh, uh, delivery, it's haram for them to marry each other. But they can marry their brothers, the brothers can marry their sisters from other pregnancies. Okay, so this is clear. So it was haram for the, 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 the twins from the same delivery to be married, but it was allowed for the brothers from different pregnancies to be married. That was Allah's law at the time. Later on, it was abrogated because of, of several reasons, uh, such as the fact that, you know, it's an inherent in a marriage that there are going to be problems and divorces etc so if you marry your own sister and then you divorce then you have committed uh, you know you break in salat al-rahim right this is one of the reasons also this is also uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before for the jews it was allowed for them to get married to two sisters at the same time but obviously because we know the the two wives they usually have uh, jealousy between them and they may have trouble then as a result the two sisters would actually fight uh, uh, between them and then they would cut the uh, the relationship of of kinship uh, that's why it was uh, it was forbidden in islam so these are some of the reasoning that the scholars have given now of course allah knows best what the real reason is but the scholars can just make a shihad to try to uh, to deduce the reason why something was allowed and later on it was forbidden Later on, it was abrogated. So they said, then, you know, Habil's sister, Habil is, is Abel. Okay, so Habil, Abel, this is the good one. Habil's sister was not beautiful. Okay, the one that was born with him was not beautiful. While he was good looking. While Qabil's sister was beautiful and Qabil was not good looking. So this pushed Qabil to want his own sister for himself. Even though it's haram, okay, but Adam refused this matter because it was not allowed unless they both offer sacrifice. So this is kind of like making a sikhara, okay. Of course, Muslims today are not allowed to do this, but for them that was the law that was given to them. So Adam alayhi salam told both of his children, Qabil and Habil, to offer a sacrifice, and he whose sacrifice was accepted. As we said, there's a fire that comes, lightning or fire that comes from the sky and burns uh, the offering. That's That means that the offering was accepted. And he whose sacrifice was accepted would marry Qabil's sister. So Habil's sacrifice was accepted while Qabil's sacrifice was rejected, which means that Habil is the one that was allowed to marry the beautiful sister of Qabil. And Qabil's sacrifice was rejected and thus, you know, he felt envy and jealousy from his brother. Ibn Abi Hatim recorded that Ibn Abbas said that during the time of Adam, the woman was not allowed in marriage for her male twin, but Adam was commanded to marry her to any of her other brothers. In each pregnancy, Adam was given a twin, a male and a female. A beautiful daughter was once born for Adam and another one that was not beautiful. So the beautiful one was the one that was born with uh, Qabil and the one that was not beautiful was born with Habil. So the twin brother of the ugly daughter, the twin of the ugly daughter who is who, who is Habil, who is the good guy, he told Qabil, the evil guy, marry your sister to me and I will marry my sister to you. Qabil said no, because I have more right to my sister because she was beautiful, right? So they both offer the sacrifice, the sacrifice of the one who offered the sheep 
was accepted. That's Habil, the good one. While the sacrifice of the other, Qabil, was not accepted. Qabil said it was the twin brother of the beautiful daughter. And Qabil only offered some produce that he did not really need. So, of course, it was not accepted. This is why the scholar said, if you want, if you want to offer something for Allah, charity, produce, uh, Eid al-Adha, for example, always try to choose the best thing to offer uh, to Allah because, unfortunately, some Muslims today, when they want to buy a house or rent an apartment or buy a car, they always go for the most expensive, uh, full of options type of product. But when it comes to religion, Eid al-Adha, they just go and say, oh, just give me any sheep, you know, small thing, anything you have, you know, a couple of pennies because I just want to get it over with. This is not how we should uh, uh, deal with offering uh, uh, charity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah is not need of our charity. We are the ones who benefit from our own charity. So we should always choose the best to give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that Allah can accept it from us. So here the, the uh, Qabil killed his brother. Okay. Qabil killed his brother out of envy and jealousy. We'll see more detail about it. This story has better than a good chain of narration. That means it was narrated in Tabar in its authentic uh, story. The statement, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ma Allah min al-muttaqeen. Verily, verily Allah accepts only from those who have taqwa, who fear Allah in their actions. Ibn Abi Hatim recorded that Abu Darda said, if I become certain that Allah has accepted even one prayer from me, it will be better for me than this life and all that is in it. This is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ma Allah min al-muttaqeen. So of course Abu Darda said, if Allah accepted one prayer from me, that means Allah considers me as among the muttaqeen, and that's better for me than everything that is in this life, uh, as Abu Darda said. Then the statement of Habil, he told his brother, لَإِنْ بَصَدْتَ إِلَيْ يَدَكَ لِتَقْتُلَنِي مَا أَنَا بِبَاسِتٍ يَدِيَ إِلَيْكَ لِأَقْتُلَكْ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهَ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ So Abel said, if you do stretch your hand against me to kill me, I shall never stretch my hand back against you to kill you because I fear Allah, the Lord of all that exists. Now, Cain's brother, we said the C is bad, Qabil, Cain's brother, the pious man, Cain's brother, who is Cain's brother, is Abel, Habil. He was pious, whose sacrifice was accepted because of his piety, said to his brother Qabil, who threatened to kill him without justification, if you do stretch your hand against me to kill me, I shall never stretch my hand back against you to kill you. I will not commit the same evil act that you threatened to commit so that I will not earn the same sin as you. Because I fear Allah, the Lord of all that exists. And as a result, I will not commit the error that you threatened to commit. Rather, I will observe patience and endurance. Abdullah bin Amr said, by Allah, Habil was the stronger of the two men. So Abel was the one that was killed, was actually stronger. But fear of Allah restricted his hand. He did not want to disobey Allah by fighting with his own brother and ended up killing him. Because as the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith recorded in two sahihs, إِذَا تَوَاجْهَ الْمُسْلِمَانِ بِسَيْفِهِمَا فَالْقَاتِ وَالْمَقْتُولِ فِي النَّارِ When two Muslims fight near each other, other, when two Muslims fight each other with their swords, both the murderer as well as the murdered will go to the hellfire. And they said, O oh Allah's Messenger, we understood the fact that the murderer will go to the hellfire. But how about the victim that was killed? Allah's Messenger, even the victim also had the intention to kill his own brother. Now we have to understand that this ruling is specific to the time of fitna. It is specific to the time of fitna when the Muslims, you know, there's this fitna between them and they're killing each other in a single society. But of course, if you are in your own house and a thief enters your house trying to harm you and your family, then of course you have to defend yourself. Okay. Also, uh, if the two Muslim armies are fighting because each one of them thinks that they are fighting for the sake of Allah, then that is different. That This hadith does not apply to it. This hadith applies in a time of fitna. Okay. It is a time of fitna that this is, this applies. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from it. <coughs> Imam Ahmad recorded 
that at the beginning of the calamity that Uthman radiallahu anh, suffered from, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas said, I bear witness that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, إِنَّهَا سَتَكُونُ فِتْنَةٌ الْقَاعِدُ فِيهَا خَيْرٌ مِنَ الْقَائِمِ وَالْقَائِمُ خَيْرٌ مِنَ الْمَاشِي وَالْمَاشِي خَيْرٌ مِنَ السَّاعِي There will be a fitna, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas uh, said during the fitna of Uthman radiallahu anh, when those evil people uh, with the leadership of Abdullah bin Sabah, who was a Jew from Yemen who claimed to be a Muslim and his sole purpose was to sow division among the Muslims and he succeeded because after him this new uh, Shia sect came out of from among the Muslims and are killing the, the Sunnis until today. So that fitna was the door that was broken according to Hudhafa al Yaman. It is a door that was closing uh, it was it was it was a door that was stopping the fitna from reaching the Muslims, but because of the killing of Uthman radiallahu anh, that door was broken and it will never be closed until the day of judgment, as Umar radiallahu anh said. And that's what's happening until today. The Shia they are killing the Sunnis everywhere in the world, and for them there is a means for them to get close to Allah subhanahu wa taala according to them. And what an utter lie it is that they are claiming. So here, Sa'ad Abi Waqas said. There will be a fitna, and he who sits idle during this fitna is better than the one who stands up. And he who stands up in this fitna is better than the one who walks in this fitna. And he who walks in this fitna is better than who, who is walking at a fast pace. When he was asked, Sa'ad Abi Waqas, what if someone enters my home and stretched his hand to kill me? Then Sa'ad Abi Waqas told him, Kun kabni Adam be just like the pious son of Adam. That means it's better for you to let him kill you than for you to try to kill him as well and you and him will go to hellfire. And we said this uh, ruling is specific to the time of fitna in a society. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save all the Muslims from it and to bring us a leader that will gather the, uh, the, the, the Muslims around the, uh, around the flag of Tawheed and to set everything that was done wrong to the Muslims to set it right. At Tamidi also recorded in this way and said this hadith is Hassan and similar is reported on this subject from Abu Huraira, Khabbab bin Arat, Abu Bakr ibn Mas'ud, Abu Waqid, and Abu Musa al Ash'ari. The Quran continues, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inni uridu an tabu abi ithmi wa ithmi ka fatakuna min ashabi nar wa thani ka jaza uzzalimin. So uh, Habir continued saying, Verily, I intend to let you draw my sin on yourself as well as your sin. Then you will be one of the dwellers of the fire, and that is the recompense of the wrongdoers. Ibn Abbas, Mujahid al-Dahak al-Suddi and Qatada said that the statement, Inni uridu an tabu abi ithmi wa ithmik, Verily, I intend to let you draw my sin on yourself as well as yours. That means draw my sin and your sin on yourself. Means the sin of murdering me. So this is... Abel, who was telling Cain that, you know, I will let you draw the sin of murdering me in addition to your previous sins, because apparently Qabil was an evildoer. Ibn Jarir recorded this. And by the way, Qabil, after killing Habil, uh, he and his uh, children, they left uh, Adam alayhi salam and they left the mountains where Adam alayhi salam was living and they went to the plains and evil spread among them. And shaitan came to them and taught them a lot of evil things like music uh, and dancing. And that was the beginning of this story of music. So for those people that say music is halal, you just ask them who was the one that taught music to mankind. Of course, if they go back to the literature, they will know that shaitan was the one that taught the Qabil and his progeny music. So of course, I want to ask you just one question and let your mind answer. Do you think that Shaitan, the enemy of the son of Adam and his children, will teach the children of Adam something that is good for them? No, he taught them music after they started dancing, after they started committing zina, and so on and so forth. It was a slippery slope. So this in itself should be enough to prove that music is haram in addition to different texts uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu told us and different texts in the Quran, in Surah Al-Luqman, and also when Allah says, He told Shaitan to uh, and enrage them and uh, poke them with your voice, and the voice of Shaitan is nothing but music according to the scholars. So here, uh, Abel told Cain 
that I want you to bear the sin of murdering me in addition to your previous sins. Ibn Jari recorded this. Allah's statement, So the soul of the other, that means the soul of Qabir, made fair semen, okay, made fair semen to him, the murder of his brother. Then he murdered him and became one of the losers because sometimes the nafs makes some evil thing look fair semen to you so that you can commit this evil. So here means that the con his conscience, the conscience, uh, or in nafs in Arabic, his conscience encouraged him to kill his brother by making it seem like a sensible, a good thing to do, a sensible thing to do. So he killed him, even after his brother admonished him. Ibn Jarir said, when he wanted to kill his brother, when Cain wanted to kill his brother Abel, uh, he started to twist his neck. He didn't know how to kill him. So Shaitan took an animal and placed its head on a rock. Then he took another rock and smashed its head with it until the animal died. So here Shaitan killed an animal with a rock, uh, trying to show uh, Abel, uh, trying to show Cain, sorry, how to kill his brother Abel. So Cain was looking at what Shaitan was doing and he learned from him. So he did the same thing to his brother. Ibn Abi Hatim also recorded this. Abdullah bin Wahab said that Abdul Rahman bin Zayd bin Aslam said that his father said, Qabil held Habil by the head to kill him. So Habil laid down for him. And he didn't fight back. And Qabil started twisting Habil's head, not knowing how to kill him. So Shaitan came to Qabil and asked him, do you want to kill him? Qabil said, yes. Shaitan said, take that stone and throw it on his, on, on his head. So Qabil took the stone and threw it at his brother's head and smashed his head. So again, Shaitan only shows mankind uh, whatever evil will lead to their destruction. Shaitan then went to Hawa in a hurry and said to her, Oh Hawa, Qabil killed Habil. She asked him, Woe to you, what does kill mean? So you will no longer eat, drink, or move. She said, And that is death? He said, Yes, it is. So she started to weep until Adam came to her while she was weeping and said, what is the matter with you? She did not answer him. He asked her two or more times, but she did not answer him. So he said, you and your daughters will inherit the practice of weeping while I and my sons are free from it. Ibn, Ibn Abi Hatim recorded it. Now, the meaning of this hadith is, is true because the Prophet did tell us about Adam when he was uh, first created, Allah uh, gave him a lifespan of a thousand years. And then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed the progeny of Adam alayhi salam to Adam, Adam alayhi salam saw a fair looking uh, one among his progeny. So he asked Allah, who is uh, this uh, this son of mine? He said, this is your son Dawood alayhi salam, the son of Sulaiman alayhi salam. So uh, Adam alayhi salam asked him, how long is he going to live? He said, he's going to live for six years. So Adam alayhi salam, he said, oh Allah, give him four years from my life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took four years from the lifespan of Adam alayhi salam and gave it to Dawood so that uh, uh, Adam alayhi salam can live 960 years and Dawood can live 100 years. But when uh, Adam alayhi salam became 960 and the angels came to take his soul, he told them, I still have four years uh, to live. They told him, no, you gave Gave forty years to your son Dawood. He told them, "No, I never, I never did that." So the Prophet ﷺ said, "Adam ﷺ forgot, and his progeny forgot after him." And Adam ﷺ argued against the fact that he gave the forty years to Dawood ﷺ, and his progeny will always argue and will deny that they did things. So the meaning of this hadith is also uh, true. So how when she wept, uh, when she wept, uh, her daughters will weep after her, because that was the beginning of creation, that was the beginning of mankind, and obviously things were trickling down until they came to us in the form that we know it today. Then Allah's statement continues and says, فَأَصْبَحْ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ That means after Cain killed his brother, became one of the losers in this life and in the hereafter. And which loss is worse than this, obviously, if you lose both lives. Imam Ahmed recorded that Abdullah bin Mas'ud said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, لا تقتل نفس ظلما إلا كان على ابن آدم الأول كفر من دمية لأنه كان أول من سن القتل. Any soul that is unjustly killed, then the first son of Adam will carry a burden of its shedding, for he was the first to practice the crime of murder. Now, obviously, if someone asks why, tell him because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, من سن سنة حسنة كان له أجرها وأجر من عمل بها ومن سن ومن سن سنة سيئة كان عليه وز كان عليه وزرها ووزدرا ووزدرها ووز 
كان عليه وزرها ووزر من عمل بها. So the Prophet said that if you start something good, for example, something good that's already in the religion, like charity, for example, like you make some organization and you collect money and you give uh, poor people, you help poor people. And then after you go, someone else comes after you and does the same thing you were doing. So even though you were gone, that person that is doing that charitable work after you will also uh, will also get uh, the reward of being charitable and also you will get the reward that he is doing this charity when they start this good charitable act that was already legislated in Islam. It's not a bid'ah that you started, right? Similarly, if, if you, for example, you open a bar, right? And of course, you're getting a sin for having this bar. And let's say you die and someone else takes over this bar. Even though you're dead, that person, the new person that has the bar will be sinning, will, you know, will have sins on him because he's, uh, he's operating this bar. And you will also get the sin of this bar being opera even though you're dead because you were the one that started this evil deed. So similarly, Cain was the first one to kill unjustly. So anyone that kills unjustly after him, Cain will get a portion of that sin. So any soul, the Prophet, Prophet said, any soul that is unjustly killed, then the first son of Adam will carry a burden of its shedding for he was the first to practice the crime of murder. The group, with the exception of Abu Dawood, that means the Sunan, also recorded this hadith. Ibn Sharir recorded that Abdullah bin Amr used to say, the son of Adam killed his brother will be the most miserable among men. There is no blood shed on earth, unjustly that is, since he killed his brother until the day of resurrection, except that Cain will carry a burden from it because he was the first person to establish murder. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فبعث الله غرابا يبحث في الأرض ليريه كيف يواري سوءة أخيه قال يا ويلة عجزت أن أكون مثل هذا الغراب فأواري سوءة أخيه فأصبح من النادمين Then Allah sent a crow who scratched the ground to show him how to hide the dead body of his brother Then the murderer came said Woe to me, am I not even able to do as this crow did and to be able to hide the body of my brother Then he became one of those who regretted So he looked down at himself and he says I'm, I'm less than this crow who is able to bury another crow and I'm not even able to do such a thing. As Suddi said that the companion said, when when Habil died, Qabi left him on the bare ground and did not know how to bury him because like there was the first person to die and Adam alayhi salam and his children did not know how to deal with dead people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent two crows which fought with each other <coughs> until one of them killed them the other so the killing crow dug a hole and threw sand over the dead corpse which this killing crow placed in the hole so crow killed another crow, dug a hole threw this dead crow in the hole and then covered him with with sand when Qabil saw that so as, as if the crow was teaching Qabil what to do with his brother when Qabil saw that he said yeah well just to an akuna mithla had al ghura bi fa'wari so at akhi woe to me Am I not even able to be as this crow and to hide the dead body of my brother? Ali ibn Abi Talha reported that Ibn Abbas said, a crow came to the dead corpse of another crow and threw sand over it until it hit it in the ground. He who killed his brother said, that means Qabil said, Ya waylata ajastu an akuna mithla hadha al-wara wariya sawata akhi. Woe to me, am I not even able to be like this crow and hide the dead body of my brother? فَأَصْبَحَ مِنَ النَّادِمِينَ Then he became one of those who regretted. Al-Hasan al-Basri commented on this statement. Allah made him feel sorrow after the loss that, that he earned. A hadith states that the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا مِنْ ذَنْبٍ أَجْدَرُ أَنْ يُعَجِّرَ اللَّهُ عُقُوبَتَهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعَا مَا يَدَّخِرُ صَحِبِي فِي الْآخِرَ مِنَ الْبَغِي وَقَطِيعَةِ الرَّحِمِ There is no sin. There is more worthy of Allah's hastening its punishment. That means the punishment is hastened in this life. In addition to what he has in store for the offender in the hereafter, more than transgression, and cutting the relationships of the womb. So people that cut the relationships of the womb, they'll be punished for it in this world before the hereafter. And also transgression, injustice. <clears throat> and the act of Qabil, who killed his brother, included both of these actions. Because he cut the relationships of the womb, he killed his own brother. And also after killing, he left his own father and mother and brothers and sisters. And he did injustice to his brother. 
This is it for today, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our good deeds, to teach us the beneficial knowledge, to uh, keep us away from all the fitan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us steadfast on the religion and to gather us with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for Jannah al-Fidaus al-Uliya wa akhir da'wan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Any questions, brothers?